What's hey, up, Kevin. Everybody? How are How's you doing? Going? Good. How are you? Good. How's your week going? Yeah, it's good. This is, uh, you know, tomorrow is kind of a day off. Monday's kind of a day off. So it's, yeah, this is uh, kind of the cap of a long week. So I'm excited for this and I'm excited for uh, a break, a little bit, a little break. Yes, know? breaks are always good. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today um, yeah, in course. their 20s. I know that we spoke, you know, a few weeks ago about our mission and its importance right now. Um, we're really trying to connect, you know, students and young people with the best advice that they can find. And we re really feel that the best way to do that is by you know, speaking with influential people to hear about the struggles and experiences of their 20s. Um, and then also just give them an opportunity to talk about all the advice that they might have. So you are one of the most influential poets, creators, and writers of our generation. Um, and we're just, again, really excited to be speaking with you about the experiences of your 20s and we feel, you know, the best place to start then is probably to talk about like a favorite poem that you probably wrote or read while you were in your 20s. And if that poem had an impact on your future um, today. Sure. Yeah. Um, I Well, first of all, man, I appreciate it. And, and I appreciate you all having me. And thank you, Landon, for everything you said. And um, thanks for, you know, continuing to, to look out. I, I appreciate you. Um, and Michael, of course, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's it's interesting. So, you know, my twenties track ninety five to basically uh, two thousand five. So that's when I was in my twenties, and my first book came out in two thousand five. So just just at the you know kind of at the tail end, um, it probably came out like in my thirtieth year because that my birthday is March twenty third. But what that meant is that that whole book was you know composed uh, while in my twenties. And, um, you know, it's my first book and it, it feels, you know, when I look back at it now, it's, it's, it feels young, but there's, there's a poem. I mean, I, but I stand by the book and I really love that book in part because it's my first book. Um, but of course, you know, I think, I hope I've learned a lot about being a writer, about being a person and, you know, I navigate writing and I navigate the world much differently than than at that time, you know? Um, although I, so I just, I just handed in my next manuscript and, I do see some similarities too, right? So that's kind of a, a, an ill and exciting thing to look back at your career and be like, oh yeah, you know, I see um, little nuggets in that piece that I, I still hold and carry with me now. And, and some of this, I think the exciting thing is that some of, the, some of the things that, some of the ideas that I had in my 20s have absolutely followed me through my life. And, and in some ways they probably originated in my twenties, you know, and I think that that is an important thing that, that you are on to good, good things when you're in your twenties or you can be, you know, and you can trust yourself and you can trust what you're excited about to help guide you through the rest of your life. And I, I think that that was a big thing. Like I, 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 you know, at 19 is when I decided I wanted to be a writer. Um, and so I got my twenties to make that a reality. I mean, and that's kind of what it, what it did. I took an idea, I took a, a dream, I took a wish and then lived into it over the course of that decade, because from the beginning of that decade to the end of that decade, um, I had been able to, uh, do the work necessary in order to hold them that title. Um, because when I, you know, if so I, in, in, let's say 95, um, in 95, I actually played ball uh, overseas. I, play, I was playing um, basketball in, in Wales. And, uh, uh, and I came back in 95 to Wicker Park and with the idea that I wanted to write. Like, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but in order to do that, you know, first of all, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and in order to do that, I knew I needed to pay rent and eat. And, you know, so I had a bunch of different jobs, you know, through my 20s. I mean, um, and like I, I, I drove a truck, um, I delivered furniture, I worked at a restaurant, I catered, um, I did other things, you know, some nefarious and, uh, but figured it out because I had that dream that I wanted to live into. I wanted, but I didn't know what that meant yet. And so I had to do all these other things in order to give myself the space, the head space, the physical space, the mental space, the spiritual space in order to discover how to live as a writer. You know, and it really took me my 20s. I mean, I, I um, you know, it, it, 
it, I didn't, I was on, um, I was on uh, HBO for the first time in 2002. So I was, you know, 27 or something like that then. And uh, that then meant that I could leave the other jobs essentially. But I was 27, 28 at that time. So it took me damn near a decade in order to be able to get to that point where I could live at, and, you know, scrape by me, you know, mind you, um, I, I could scrape by living as a writer, performer, um, but, but it took me a decade in order to do that. To your point, Landon, because I know I just went off on a tangent, there, <laughs> yeah, in, in, you know, all, all, the, all my books are on like this little corner of my shelf. There's, there's a poem in my first book called, uh, the book's called Slingshots, and there's a poem in there called Pieces of Shalom that is this like sprawling big poem um, about, you know, some of where I come from and uh, some of the content in there, I, I, I still wrestle with and still deal with. And that's in the first section of the book. And in the last section of the book is, uh, is there's a poem called Hero Israel, which is um, kind of me very publicly announcing my uh, support of uh, people in Palestine and my kind of anti-Zionist take as a Jewish person, which, you know, kind of announced, uh, I'd been doing that poem for that point, at that point for a few years, but it was in print now and it kind of announced to the world that this young Jewish kid is taking this political stance that is not popular now, was less popular 20 years ago, you know? Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I actually really enjoyed the tangent as well. I mean, I don't think that you need to apologize for that. I think that, you know, when it comes to passions, a lot of people want to um, you know, live within these passions that they're really, you know, like are important to them, but you got to work for those. I mean, you have to like grind, you have to take on the other, you know, responsibilities uh, to make your passions become a reality. Um, and I think, you know, as creatives, that's really, really important to recognize that if, if you want to work towards that dream, it's not going to come today. It's not going to come tomorrow. You really need to work hard for that. You need to multitask. You need to take on other responsibilities because you still have the bills to pay, um, rent to pay. But once you are really, you know, engulfed in that, and once opportunities come your way, uh, you can make that dream become your reality. For real, like take your 20s to do that, right? Like it takes a decade. You know, I mean, that's, that's one, right? It takes 10 years of you doing something. I, I wrote, you know, I write damn near daily. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I get up at the same time every morning and I write. And I've been doing that since I was 19. So it takes that amount of time to get good at something, to get decent at something. Um, especially if you're starting, you know, from a you know, if, if wherever you're starting, right, you're not good, whatever you're doing, you're not going to be good when you start. But it but but if you want to be good at it, I think take that's what I tell I, you know, I teach college, I teach high school. And I tell my, you know, college students, that your 20s are absolutely for finding the thing or things that you think you might want to do. And it's about exploring, it's about picking something up, and you know investing in it and being a nerd about it and going all in. And maybe you realize, that's not what you fuck with. Okay, cool. You still like go, go find the thing that you love and try then to invest yourself fully in doing that thing. And that, that stance is amazing. And it, it kind of leads into our next question where, so you currently serve as a mentor in many ways to like young poets and writers um, in their twenties and teenage years. And you even had the opportunity to mentor Chance the Rapper at one point. Uh, talk to us about the importance that you see in being a mentor and also having a mentor when you're at that critical age. So when you're early in the, in your writing. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I got lucky when I was a young writer where I would go to venues. I had, you know, I had a fake ID and I could go to clubs and, and, and spots where you could get on the open mic. And I had, I didn't know anybody when I went and I was the youngest kid in the place. And some of the older writers, every now and again, before I left, uh, they would grab me before I walked out the door. And they were like, hey, that was, that was, that was cool. Um, hope to see you around, come back next week. And that was like, I was like, oh shit. Like, cause I had talked to nobody, I didn't know anyone. You know what I mean? And that was kind of what I needed to kind of, to continue. That was like the cosign I needed. And so for me, I think part of what mentorship is, or at least this is, how I think I mentor is that I'm really a hype man. You know, I'm just, I'm encouraging people to follow. If you have an idea about the shit that you want to do, go do that, but, but go, but go do it for real. And I think part of then the role of like hype man to mentor 
is not just be like, yes, you can do anything. It's like, you can do anything if you work, motherfucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can do anything if, like I believe, like you can tell me any, you, anything you tell me, I'm going to hear you, right? I'm going to really like, okay, word, word. All right, now, now how, you know? So yes, and is like the Chicago improvisational gem that the, you know, I think we've given to the world. And I think that's also what a mentor does is like really listen and then ask critical and critically constructive questions to help somebody hopefully achieve that idea. And really from what we've seen is you're really good at like creating these spaces for young writers and young poets as well. So even in your 20s, you accomplished all these things, but you also co-founded uh, the festival Louder Than a Bomb. So it's also known as the Chicago Teen Poetry Festival. It's one of the, like it grew to be one of the largest youth poetry slams in, in the entire country. So what was your vision for this? Why did you create Louder Than a Bomb? And what did you imagine its impact was gonna be? Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, so I, that was something that, that I did in my 20s too. And, I mean, one of the things I did when I got back to Chicago, I started teaching eventually. Like I took, so I took about a year and a half, two years to run around to every open mic imaginable. Um, anytime anyone asked me to read a poem in public, I did. If anyone asked me to submit a poem, I did. You know what I mean? It's like, I was just those two years, I was grinding and grinding and grinding. And then uh, a buddy kind of knew what I was doing asked me to his to teach in his alternative high school class in 97 and so in 97 um i you know I, mind you i don't have a college degree i you know school formal school didn't work out for me in that way uh and so in 97 you know he's like we'll come through um i'll take you out to lunch you know um i was like word i'm definitely trying to eat and so uh i went to his class i was you know 21 maybe 22 at the time, the students in an alternative high school were, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. So we were, you know, right there in terms of age. And I, you know, the, the, my only lesson idea was to bring in, I was going to bring in like a Lauren Hill record because the Fuji's uh, record, the Fuji's album, the second album had just dropped and uh, a Gwendolyn Brooks poem. And I was going to try to get them to write. In truth, all we did was talk about the, the score, the Fuji's record, um, for probably like an hour, hour and a half, or whatever, how long the class was. But afterwards, my buddy was like, yo, you should teach. Like, you should, you know, you your ability to relate and break down essentially literature with, you know, and have a con facilitate a conversation around literature with my students. I've never seen them interact like that with the text. Um, you, should, this, you should do this. And so they got me a residency at that school and then a residency in the alternative high school network the year afterwards. And so from 97 to probably about 2001, I ran around to those 23 high schools in that network, uh, creating um, spaces where the students could come gather, write, storytell, listen to hip hop, write, you know, hip hop, poetic lyric type joints. And um, because I was running around, um, but Chicago was so segregated, the students I was working with wouldn't necessarily meet each other. And in my mind, I was like, oh, word, you know, Mike has a ton in common with Tanisha, um, but Tanisha lives on the west side, Mike lives out south, and so how, what are we gonna do? And so I was working um, at that point in 2000, 2001, uh, with a woman named uh, Anna West and um, the Young Chicago Authors Crew and a whole bunch of uh, very committed and dope teaching artists like Avery R. Young and Tara Betts um, and a whole, like a whole, Peter Kahn, a whole squad of, of writers like myself who were now interested in education and teachers who were interested in using this new kind of writing in their classroom in order to engage their students. And so collectively, in 2001, when the towers fell and uh, Chicago was trying to pass this anti-gay loitering law, we were like, yo, we need to do something that is different. We need to like, the, all the nonsense, all the noise, all the jingoism, the nationalism, all that is problematic to say the least. Um, and we need to counter that culture of fear with something else. And so uh, we, you know, Chicago is the home of the Poetry Slam. You know, Poetry Slam started in 
a bar in Chicago in 1984 uh, because a construction worker at that time and writer named Mark Smith stood up on top of a table and gave other drunkards scorecards to judge him and his friends poems essentially so they would pay attention um and so we you know mark was uh, a bit of a mentor absolutely and kind of blessed us you know he's like yes you like let's take this to high school students um and so in 2001 uh you know which is i you know i was 26 um, or something like that at the time uh yeah we came up with with lala and a bomb and we did we did the first one in a in a packed basement of the Chopin Theater. We had, I think, uh, maybe five teams and like 100, 150 people in the audience. And we were like, yo, this is this is something. Let's let's continue to, to try to do this. Wow, it's a, it's a truly amazing kind of impact behind that. In uh, you're trying to bring writers together. And I think that's really important because some people, they might not geographically be able to reach each other, but they might have ideas that can they can bounce off each other and make something amazing. You got to, I mean, you know, it's like, you got to work with people who are going to make you better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a creative, as an artist, regardless of your discipline, even if like I, I learned from painters and DJs and uh, fashion designers about my craft, you know, but, but I think you also want people who do your craft, people who are dope around you to make your shit tighter, you know, like, you know, that, 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 adage like steel sharpened steel you know and you and you rise with your circle you know what i mean like you will be you will be dope by who you also keep around you so keep dope people around you you know love that and that's why we're glad we could have you on today because you are very fucking dope <laughs> appreciate, I appreciate it Kevin. i appreciate that man. um so our last question for you now um we went over um you know the importance of creativity writing and collaboration um, we went over your experiences as a poet um, if you had just general advice for up and coming poets and writers, um, as young as they might be right now, what would that be? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think there's, there's advice I, I guess I have for writers and poets specifically and creatives in general. Um, for poets and writers, I would say you have to read. You know, you cannot, you cannot add to a form without being aware of the history in which you're partaking. It doesn't mean you need to ally to that form. It doesn't mean you need to be an expert. It doesn't mean you need to know any kind of canon. What I mean is that make up your own canon, but make it up. You know what I mean? Like pull some books. Uh, I'm, I started to read, the reason why I wanted to write is because I read uh, the Source magazine had hip hop quotables, like a 16 from, you know, whatever MC that month. And I would read those. And when I first saw a poem in a book, I'm like, oh, poems are in a book are whack. I wish that they would read like these hip hop quotables. And then eventually I found poets who, you know, made me feel like the way I felt reading these lyrics. And so I made up my own canon. Um, and so poets and writers, you got to read. And then you got to write. You know, there's no magic behind it other than the magic you put into it. So if you aren't doing your work, the work is not going to come. You know what I mean? I think, um, so I, th I think that's for any artist in some ways too. Like you, you, I, I would say that, yeah, this is probably universal for any creative, you know, um, if you're a sculptor, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to know the history of sculpting. Um, but I think what it can mean is that you start to look at sculptural objects and understand like who, who is in your lineage? You know, you make up your lineage, that's fine, but start to claim people, start to like be a nerd about that thing that you're doing and go investigate it and, and dig into it um, deeply. And, and I, think, I think that's part of the thing is that you, you just have to invest. You have to put time into yourself. You have to understand that your dream, your vision for yourself is, is in your own control. You know, you live your own life. And so if you want to, uh, you know, be a chef, if you want to, you know, make, uh, you know, cute dog sweaters and sell them on Etsy, like do that shit, you know what I mean? But like, give yourself the opportunity and space to do that. You know, like, like you have to carve out the space. I, I have to sit down in order to write a poem that will then be uh, in a book, but I have to sit, you know, that, that all takes time. And it's really like, it, it's kind of, it's selfish. It's be like, yo, I'm going to take the hours and hours and hours and hours it takes to make this thing because I believe I, my, my making of this thing is a contribution to our, 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 our greater good, our greater space. You know, I believe that, that, that if I take time away from my partner, away from my dog, away from my family, you know, if, and, and, and I carve out and fight for that time, 
um, that I have to believe in it enough. I have to believe in myself and I have to believe in making that thing enough that that thing has the, the opportunity to make a difference, even if that difference is just so I can be like, yo, I made that motherfucking thing and I like it. You know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. It's so great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, really, really appreciate that. You know, when Michael and I, uh, you know, originally wanted to have you on, uh, we wanted you to speak to, you know, aspiring poets and writers, but honestly, I mean, towards the end of this, we're realizing that there's so much inspiration in this interview that this is for everybody. <laughs> and like, really just thank you so much for bringing your energy. Uh, thank you for bringing your passion. But again, most importantly, thank you for bringing yourself, uh, your, authentic, your authentic self. I mean, we really appreciate the time that you've spent uh, to inspire our viewers and our listeners um, who have so many questions about their 20s right now. So thank you. No, oh, thank you, man. And uh, thank you both. Thank you for doing thank this. I, I wish that I had, uh, you know, I, I wish I had more peers when I was in my 20s, like encouraging me. And so I think the, I think what you guys are doing, the platform you guys are creating is really important. And and I would just say, you know, to both of you and, and you know, Landon, I, I know you are absolutely someone who does this, like, you know, you, you have an idea and you follow it. And I think that's a testament to you and, and to, to both you guys and just continue to do that. And I mean, your 20s is very much about figuring it out and it's it's yes. great and perfect to not know it and just you know go go get it you know what i mean appreciate that thank yeah. you Kevin. yeah thank you guys uh have a great weekend and look look forward to talking to you all again